Yay! 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 My favorite thing! Sometimes a game really captures my attention and my brain. And that's what I'm bringing you right now. So if you're hunting for a good game, you're hunting for a great experience, look no further than The Lost Ruins of Arnak. This game has a little bit of a steep learning curve just because there's so much to set up and there's a lot of stuff on the board, meaning there are a lot of components and places that you get to go on your turn. But what makes this game so good is there's great symbology and so everything once you learn it makes sense. When you're seeing particular symbols or representations of resources and items, you got it. I mean, it's it's actually so clean and streamlined. And the other thing that makes this game really easy to play and to come back to is that it has been play tested so well that the balance in this is perfect. I will tell you about my personal experience playing the game as I go through all the different locations on the board, the different components like the resources and the cards uh, and things like that, so that you can actually get a feel for how the game works and maybe some strategy if you get a chance to play Lost Ruins of Arnak. So the heart of this game is really just a deck builder, but it's a pretty unique deck builder. So don't think that it's that kind of traditional in the sense that you're going to go through your deck a whole lot and you're going to shuffle your deck normally like you do in most deck builders. More to come on that. But it's a deck builder with a worker placement. And so you're going to, on your turn, take a turn. You're going to take an action and you can do one main action and then you can do as many free actions as you want. Now these actions are going to consist of dig at a site, discover a new site, overcome a guardian, buy a card, play a card, research, and pass. So what players want to do in this game is they kind of want to discover these lost ruins. Now, I know that's part of the title, but really it's the game. You want to go to these sites, you want to discover them, you also just want to get benefits of sites that have been discovered, but when you go to these places and you uncover these secrets, there are going to be guardians that protect it essentially, and so you can overcome a guardian, and that's essentially fighting off the power in that area. It's so much fun, but there's also so many things you can do on your turn. And just when you think your turn is done, because all you get to do is draw five cards on your turn and then play any number of those cards as part of your entire round, your game will just start back up again because you'll get an action on an artifact that lets you do this and draw a card and reactivate an assistant. And there are these wonderful kind of super juiced turns that can really, really surprise you. So I think with the basic game, you've got again, deck building, you draw five cards and then you get to take your action and you go back and forth. Um, with the two player, you just go around the table clockwise, everyone takes a turn. And then the last thing you do is pass essentially and other players can continue playing if they can. The game is played over five rounds and it's super easy to actually mark your progress because there is a moon staff that continually moves across the top of the board. But it's not just for keeping track of the actual rounds, it's for showing you how many cards are available from the item deck and from the artifact deck, which is again, such a cool mechanic that's a dual purpose in this game. And again, that's just like one super easy example of how clean and awesome this game is, right? It's doing so many things at once. So in these five rounds, players are going to draw their five cards, take turns in player order. Then once they can't play anymore, they will pass. And then there is set up for the next round. And then you move the moon marker and that's it. That's an entire round. You do five of those and the game is over. Now each round, you still have the same amount of workers to place out. You still have five cards that you draw. And so the game doesn't get shorter or longer as you go 
but I think there are just more and more decisions to make as you continue. And I mean, in the third round, I think it was, I had my best round, meaning I got to play the most cards and I got to do the most actions and I got to get the most resources. And so it really varies from player to player when you're gonna get those really great cards you've been building up to and uh, any of those kinds of strategies you've been you know, employing and when it actually activates. My favorite part of the game is how the deck works. So when you buy a card, you are going to place it on top of your brand new draw pile. <laughs> you just buy it and you put it straight on the top of your deck, which means that will be one of the five cards you draw for your next turn. So there's no buying a card, putting it in your discard pile, and then shuffling it up, and then shuffling it straight to the bottom of the deck, and never playing it or seeing it one time in the game. The way that you do it here is you buy it, place it on the top, you use it next, and then you put it in your discard pile essentially for that round. Now that's even a really unique thing too, because after your turn is over and you've passed, you take all the cards that you played that round, you shuffle them up, and then you place them underneath your draw pile. So there's never a giant stack of I'm going to go through all my cards in my draw pile and then they're going to stack up in my discard pile and then I shuffle them all up and again I shuffle all the good ones to the bottom. No, this is a way for you to keep cards in the same space, mostly, minus the brand new cards that you just bought and put on top, but it doesn't get stuff lost. And I really, really like that because it takes my favorite part of Aeon's End, which is that you never shuffle your cards and you just continually place them face up and then you just turn your deck over and you put it over when you need a draw pile and you just draw. Which is like the last, the very first card you played is now the first card you draw. Again, that's a really cool way of doing a deck builder. So in this one, really, really unique way. Again, I haven't seen this mechanism. So really awesome. I love the deck and I love the cards and I love the way they work. I really like how multifunctional the cards are as well. There are movement symbols, and you might even have a double symbol, which means you have two of that particular thing, like an airplane, a wagon, a ship, or a boot. The other thing is that there's the cost in the bottom left corner for how much the card costs to acquire. In the bottom right corner, there's the victory point symbol, and in the middle, there is exactly what the card does. It's just awesome. Very, very easy to understand, easy to activate. And the great thing about when you buy an artifact card is that you get to do the thing on the card when you buy it. And then it goes in your discard pile. So the artifact cards don't go on top of your deck. It's just the item cards that go on top of your deck for next time so you can use it. But with the artifact cards, you get to use them right away. So that goes into your strategy. You're looking at the top and you're like, oh, if my opponent goes and gets that card and then activates it right away, I can't use that, which means I can't do this and I can't do that. And so you're planning the action of the card you want in that artifact section into your gameplay for that particular round, especially if you can buy it. And those cards are pretty expensive, but there are item cards that give you discounts to buy the artifact cards. As I said before, I really like how the moon staff continually moves and marks the progression of round to round to round, so it progresses the game, but it also allows there to be more items in the beginning and fewer artifacts, and then as the game goes on, there are more and more artifacts available and fewer items, because you're going to be using items less and you're going to want the actions and the victory points that are available on the artifacts, but they're harder to get. So in the beginning, you're really poor. You may not be able to afford them, but you can afford an item for a dollar or two. I think that's so intuitive. I love that. And I found that the balance of the art artifacts to items uh, throughout the entire course of the game was spot on. When you're at a location, you can fight a guardian or you can just flee. Now, when you flee, you get a fear card, and fear cards just junk up your deck, and they also are a negative one victory point. And so when you draw one, it's one of your five cards, and so not good to have, but it's also not so big of a ding that you can't flee 
and still recover. There might even be really strategic moments for you to flee a guardian, particularly if you can't afford to fight them because you don't have the resources necessary or the images or the symbols necessary to fight it off. So the two cool things you get when you overcome a guardian is their boon, and that is going to be the stuff in the top right corner, like resources and cool maybe movement icons and things like that. The other thing is you're going to get victory points, and that's going to be on that particular guardian, depending on which pile it came from. So as you can see, it's awesome to fight a guardian and to defeat it because you get so much stuff, but you can go back and fight them later, uh, hopefully if your opponents have not actually gone to fight them before you can return, but that guardian just stays there until someone fights it and it will give someone a fear if they flee that area, but then you can get away to safety. And again, it's not that bad. It's something you can actually you know, mitigate. It, it's not crippling. And I like that again. The balance is so good. Do not underestimate the assistance and getting not just the basic assistance, but flipping them over for those expert assistants. And so you don't have to necessarily pay as much to get a really cool thing, or the cool thing you already had gets even cooler. And so there are two spaces on each player's personal board to acquire assistance, and then each round you get to use an assistant. So the earlier you get them, the more you get to use them, because you get to use them once per round. There are opportunities to unexhaust an assistant and then reuse them in the same round which again, I, I just can't tell you, it's so cool. There are so many choices in this game and so many wonderful things, but do not underestimate the assistance. I think the research track is fantastic as well. It's one of my favorite places to go. It's so interesting the way you can get bonuses for going on a place first, but you also get the bonus that's on the side of the track. You have two markers that you're moving, and there are restrictions on moving one marker um, faster than the other one or equal to. You're not allowed to move the other one past it. And there are also different routes to go up. So if someone goes on one side and you have the resources for the ones on the left route, go on the left route. Now the goal is to get a lot of great benefits along the way. You can get immediate benefits if you're the first one there, and you also get immediate benefits because you move onto that space. There's a track along the right side, and it's gonna tell you exactly what your reward is. You wanna go all the way up the research track to where you get big victory points at the end of the game. Do not underestimate that. I will tell you right now that when I played, it came down to a tie, and we were both on the edge of our seat waiting to figure out, okay, how do we break this tie? And it came down to who got to the top of the research track first. It was me. It was so exciting to find that out. You know now, it's not a surprise. <laughs> it's in the rules. Um, but do not underestimate the research track and its victory point benefits. It's really, really awesome. Don't forget that you can hire a pilot, which just means that you actually get to have an airplane symbol if you pay two gold. Don't forget that. You will forget it because everyone forgets it when they play the game. We did. Um, but you can hire an assistant to get that airplane symbol to go in any location that you want or to pay an airplane symbol when you need to as long as you have two gold to pay for it. So in your first game, you're going to want to start on the Bird Temple board side but there is an entirely different board called the Snake Temple side. And that has a different research track, different requirements for going to sites and digging, and other really cool things to make the game super, super replayable. In addition, there's a solo version. So this game isn't just for two to four people going to search for the lost ruins of Arnak. You can do it all on your own. I really, really hope you like Lost Ruins of Arnak as much as I do. It is so versatile, it is so clever, and I think it's just a great strategy game that's just fun to play too. It is just a fun time the entire time, and it has some really cool new mechanics that I haven't seen, but they are so seamlessly incorporated with some other great, great mechanics to create a dynamic and just awesome game. So throw yourself into a game as soon as you can and let me know in the comments below. And if you've played it, please definitely tell me what you think. I'd love to hear about it. I'll see you next time. Go! My favorite thing. <laughs> My favorite thing.